Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, just a few notes before we begin. Uh, one, this meeting is being recorded, uh, so just a note to that. Uh, and uh, we have some really wonderful information for you all this morning on day two of our North Carolina Countdown to College Education Professionals Week. This is our uh, second year holding this. And we were we are so excited to have uh, you all here. Um, you're going to hear a lot of wonderful information from two great folks with the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority this morning. Uh, and um, we are uh, recording it, as I said. We have a, a few things I know we'll get some questions on. Um, we will uh, send out an email to you all later today with a copy of this presentation, as well as a bit uh, other pieces of information for you all. Uh, your CEU information, your CEU certificate will be emailed out in the next 48 hours to you all. That'll come from me, so keep a, an eye out for that. Um, and this recording will be available within the next week. We'll send you all an email link once it becomes available, but we also will have a YouTube channel. Um, our CFNC has a YouTube channel. We'll have a playlist specifically for the 2022 Education Professionals Week. Hopefully you were all able to join us yesterday as we talked about C2C basics and professional, uh, professional tools, pro tools. Uh, today we'll be talking to you about um, the FAFSA tools. And then we have a few other programs coming up this week as well. If you have any questions as you go through, uh, please feel free to use the chat feature. We'll be answering those as we go through. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our two speakers for this morning. We have Dr. Catherine Marker uh, with the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority. She's the Director of Grants, Training, and Outreach. And then we have a new face here, which you all will be very excited that we have with us now. We have Kathy Hastings McDonald. She's also with the State uh, Education Assistance Authority, and she is the Associate Director for Outreach. So I'm going to pass it over to these two experts and let us know if you have any questions in the chat. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Thanks, April. And I am so grateful to all of you who are joining us today. I know this is a super, super busy time of year. So we really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about how you can help students take that important first step with the FAFSA. Um, and we're, it, this is such a, a critical point in terms of helping them prepare for their future. So thanks for joining us today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and let me get our um, slideshow going. There we go. You should be able to see <clears throat> the welcome screen now. Um, so to get you acclimated a little bit with the various players that all work collaboratively behind the scenes to help you all in helping students. First is the North Carolina SEAA, which Catherine and I are both with, as April shared. Um, SEAA is the state agency with the mission to help North Carolina pay for education. NCSEAA has the responsibility for North Carolina's state aid to uh, to students in UNC schools, private colleges, and community colleges. SEAA collaborates with other education organizations, including College Foundation, to provide CFNC.org, which is a free college access service for our citizens. So feel free to ask questions about CFNC if you have them today in the chat. We will have folks working behind the scenes to answer your questions. However, this session today will really uh, drill down and focus on the FAFSA tools specifically so that you know what's available to you in terms of helping students complete their FAFSA. SEAA is responsible for the password protected finish the FAFSA report, which is available in the Pro Tools section of the CFNC.org uh, website. Our second partner, or third partner, I should say, is My Future NC, which sponsors the North Carolina First and FAFSA Collaborative that provides the publicly available FAFSA tracker. Our state agency has been, is super grateful for the attention that they've done to raise awareness for FAFSA. And we work, uh, they are a strong partner of ours in coordinating these FAFSA tools. Um, Please note that over the next year, the FAFSA tracker is going to be transitioning from the My Future NC website to SEAA um, and will be mailed available uh, publicly through the CFNC.org website. So you'll get more information on that when that becomes available. For today's agenda, 
We're going to start by talking a little bit about why completing the FAFSA is so important. Then we'll move into talking a little bit about the FAFSA tracker in particular. So that's, again, the publicly available um, dashboard that you and some of your, your um, leadership and some of your community partners can use. Then I'll switch it over to Catherine, who will go into more detail on finish the FAFSA, which is the tool that you can use to know which students still might need assistance in completing their FAFSA. We'll talk a little bit about data challenges. Anytime you're digging into data, there's always some nuances. It's helpful to know what those are and some so solutions that you can use to um, work through those. And finally, we'll finish up by sharing some FAFSA resources that you can use to share with your students. <clears throat> now, for those of you who aren't familiar, I feel like we talk about FAFSA all the time, but FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. So today's session is about the North Carolina FAFSA tools. Um, there's some important resources that are available to you, lots and lots of resources on the CFNC website under the Pay for College section. You'll see a tab for FAFSA assistance. There's lots of great resources there, so I encourage you to go to that. We'll try to drop direct links to some of these website links um, in the chat for you so you can go straight to those pages. Paying for college starts with the FAFSA, but there's more to financial aid, and CFNC offers help for those tools too. So you'll see that under the financial aid frequently asked questions on the pay for college, um, college financing resources page. One important thing for you to note, um, if you are used to using the fafsa.gov URL, the Department of Ed is shifting to one website for all tasks and topics related to student aid. So you may notice if you type in fafsa.gov in your URL, it redirects to the studentaid.gov website. It'll continue to do that for the foreseeable future, but we should plan from here forward to just use the studentaid.gov website. And again, we'll drop the direct link in. But when you get to that studentaid.gov web page, you'll see the nav bar and under the apply for aid section is where your students would go to complete their FAFSA. Now, just filling out the FAFSA actually opens up lots of potential opportunities for financial aid, not only at the federal level, but also at the state financial aid level. And even many colleges and universities use information on the FAFSA to determine what aid students might be available at the institutional level too. So one application unlocks access to quite a bit of financial aid, depending on, on what the student qualifies for. So that's why it's such an important first step. And, you know, to put it in context, North Carolina faces a growing need for talent. Two thirds of our jobs are projected to require education after high school by 2030, yet less than half of North Carolinians have that education level. So the state set a statewide attainment goal, shooting to have 2 million working age North Carolinians to hold a high quality credential by 2030 so that today's students are prepared for tomorrow's jobs. FAFSA completion is one of those uh, early steps that's really important in helping us reach that goal. Today, we're going to talk about two powerful tools that you can use, you and your partners can use in helping students take this important first step the FAFSA tracker, and the Finish the FAFSA CFNC Pro Tools report. So let's dive into the FAFSA tracker first. Again, currently it's located on the My Future NC website. It will be migrating to the CFNC website later this year so that you can go to one place for both tools. But right now they're, they're in two separate places. This is publicly available FAFSA data that is displayed through a visualization software tool called Tableau, and it's matched with county profile demographic data. It's updated each week on, uh, on Tuesday, and you can look for this falls data in about mid-October, which will start to populate with the class of 2023 FAFSA data. This winter, again, is when the tracker will be moving to CFNC, so we'll make sure we get lots of information out there so you know when that transition is happening. But on the tracker, there's lots of um, ways of looking at the data so you can get a sense of how your school might be doing relative to other schools in your district or other schools that are, that are like your schools in other parts of the state. 
you can look at performance across your entire district. You can also drill down into more information at the school level. So again, this is publicly available information that your superintendent, your principal, your community partners can look at to just kind of stay on top every week and see how FAFSA completion is progressing throughout the season. The to kind of ground folks in how, you know, what is the FAFSA completion rate or how do you calculate it? It's, it's calculated by dividing the number of the school's senior FAFSA filers by the total number of seniors in the class. So if you have a school with 69 seniors and 36 of them have completed the FAFSA, the completion rate is 36 divided by 69 or 52%. So the numerator is the number of FAFSA filers and the denominator is the total number of seniors. If you're with a private school with no senior class count automatically populating on the website, you can use the FAFSA completion rate calculator to get the rate for your school. You simply select your school from the drop down, then enter the number for your graduating class and press enter and it'll calculate it for you. But that's also a great reminder that you can be owning your own data at your school you're closer to how many students are at your school, which students have completed, and which students maybe have started a FAFSA but haven't completed it. So we encourage you to have this calculation ready so you can be on top of your own FAFSA completion rate throughout the season. Now, when you go to the detailed school page, you're going to see something in the middle of the page um, submitted versus completed. This is really important for professionals like you who work directly with seniors at the school. That way, um, you can go to the other tool that Catherine will talk about in a few minutes called Finish the FAFSA to identify the specific students who have started a FAFSA but haven't completed one, which means they're not currently be being considered for financial aid. So in this example, we have 362 seniors to have submitted the FAFSA, but only 339 who have completed one, which means there's a difference of 23 seniors. Education professionals like you and some of your partners working with high, directly with high school seniors can use the Finish the FAFSA tool, the other tool to identify which one of those students maybe started a, a FAFSA but it, it is not considered completed for one reason or another. Using the other tool, you can figure out what's kind of getting in the way so that you can guide them um, with what they still need to do to complete the FAFSA. Now in 2022, this last year, my future NC uh, looked to recognize six schools for their innovative practices in helping to increase the number of students who had completed a FAFSA, knowing how important it is for students to complete in order to attend college. So if you're looking for some new strategies and new opportunities or new things to try to get students interested in completing the FAFSA, I encourage you to go on that website, which shares some of the innovative practices those schools did that might give you some new ideas to try this year. Finally, just a, a quick uh, reminder that the FAFSA tracker is the publicly available tool that your school leadership and community partners can use to monitor your school's completion rate via the public data. Moving to finish the FAFSA, that's the tool that professionals like you who work directly with seniors can use to move the needle by reaching out to specific students with information that's it's secure information in that report that will help uh, you do specific outreach to students. That's available in your CFNC Pro Tools. And with that, I am gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Catherine, who's gonna take it from here and go a little deeper in the Finish the FAFSA tool. Catherine. Yes, yours. hey, good morning, everyone. Um, there were a few questions in the chat that I can speak to. It's not always easy to make this um, explanation. I'm alluding to the data challenges that Kathy mentioned at the beginning. But so the, the first answer would be if your public school, I'm sorry, the question was why doesn't my public charter school show on the tracker? Why isn't it posted with the other schools? Um, so a couple of things to check. If it's a brand new school, it's going to take a minute because the um, you know, we have to get the information from the federal government and that's not always seamless when you have a school that merges with another school or it's brand new. So that would be one thing, not to give up, but that would be an explanation. 
Um, also, you won't see your school if it has fewer than five FAFSA completions. There's no data reported until there's at least five. So uh, right now, it, we're in uh, a different time of the year, but in October, there will be a lot of schools in early October that may not have five, particularly if they've got a small senior class. So as the new year starts, that could be um, an explanation. And then I saw someone um, rightly put in the chat that the cooperative innovative high schools have their own tab. That wasn't true the first year of the tracker. It was true either at the beginning of last year or during the year. So if you're a cooperative innovative high school, look at that tab. So hopefully that helps. I also did put in the chat the email address for the tracker because right now um, we are waiting in the wings at SEAA, but right now my future NC is um, managing the tracker. So a little bit of a transition there, but their email, if you've exhausted all those other reasons and none of them are true about your school and it just doesn't appear, you could email my future at that address I put in the chat and that would that would help. So um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about finish the FAFSA, but the first and biggest question is how do you get to it and how do you make sure you have access? So before I share my screen, let me just give you a little bit of a, a background and then we have a colleague here, uh, Mark Wiles, to, who can help you a little bit with Pro Tools because it's all part of your Pro Tools access. So Finish the FAFSA is a report, one of the college reports, inside your Pro Tools, your, your professional access, inside cfnc.org. The Finish the FAFSA is geared to specific group of people. So not everyone who has a Pro Tools account necessarily has access to finish the FAFSA. So that extra level of permission that's needed can often trip up those of us who really do need access. You know how security can be. It's important, but it often gets in the way. So um, we have worked to make that a little smoother. And um, before I start with the report and, and what information you see and how you might leverage it, I'd like to see if Mark's out there because he offered to do a quick explanation um, to really set this out. So if you're there, Mark, now would be a great time. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. And can you hear me all right, Catherine? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. April, thank you for enabling the screen share. I'm going to open up my um, screen and I'm going to go over to a browser where right now, can you see that I'm on cfnc.org? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, to first of all, go through the steps of gaining access to Pro Tools, I would encourage you to go this path. You can go to education professionals and you'll see a link here to professional tools. And the important thing I think to remember here is that the steps in gaining access um, are two. So it's not just one, it's not only having the cfnc.org account connected to your official school or organization email address, it's also completing the online request form. So two steps, and this online request form will take you over to Pro Tools Help. So I'm gonna click that. And when I go over to Pro Tools Help, I see the request form for requesting access for Pro Tools. So I won't go through all of this, the fields here, but you'll see a call out here for the Finish the FAFSA report requests. So as Catherine is pointing out, it is a second level permission. So the first thing you need to do is secure your Pro Tools access. Then you can complete the form for the Finish the FAFSA report. So if you want to learn more, you can click here and you can see more about the Finish the FAFSA reporting what it looks like. I can zoom in here. And then if this is something you want to move forward with, you can follow the link to the Finish the FAFSA form. And this, this data, these data will go directly to SEIA who will who review your request. So that's just a, a really quick overview. You'll find if you go to Pro Tools Help, uh, you'll find it's also listed in the FAQs. So if you have colleagues who are wondering about how to gain access, uh, there are links here uh, as well. What would you add, Catherine, or maybe there are questions? That was helpful. I mean, it's helpful to have um, 
have that explanation. So finish the FESA, and I can talk a little bit more about this as we go forward, is um, governed by a number of data share agreements because it is FAFSA information and the federal government doesn't let you look at that um, without some um, precautions in place. So I apologize, it does feel like it's an extra step and it, it, it shouldn't be that uh, complicated, although thank goodness Mark, I think has made it as seamless as possible, but it's you know governed by these um, data share agreements. So I would, I would put that out there and I saw a, um, uh, a question in the chat about was it per school or per person so it's per person certainly finish the FAFSA might not be available to all of the professionals in a school if a professional does not work with seniors on college completion and FAFSA completion then that person doesn't have access they don't need it so they may work um, with another class of students you know juniors they may work with seniors but not on FAFSA completion so it's per student. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that, Mark, or if you see other questions that you want to kind of address. Turn around, Tara. Are you seeing any questions there, April? Turn around. Just that turn around time that Catherine was mm -hmm. just mentioning. Okay, it depends on, uh, I can't speak to, to the Finish the Fast report. I know for Pro Tools access, which again is added to a cfnc.org account tied to your school email address, we ask you to allow two weeks. Uh, we have a process that we have to follow where we're verifying that you are indeed affiliated with that school or organization. It's, it's highly sensitive data and we wanna make sure we're, we're honoring uh, security policies that will, will help us all. And what would you say for you, Catherine, once they have Pro Tools access, then they could request uh, the add-on permission for uh, the Finish the FAFSA report. What do you think there? So first I'll say that right now there is no data in Finish the FAFSA. So last year's data had to be purged. And of course the FAFSA isn't open until October the 1st. So there's no data for you to see. So even if you had access last year and you go to it now, it's going to say there's no information available, which, you know, now that I say that isn't the most helpful error message because it should, it might say to you, you know, wait until October the 1st, or this is the, the the dead time for FAFSA information, because we are required to purge the data from one year, and of course, then we can't start the new year until October the 1st. So if you had access in a previous year, you should still have access that, and you know, that should not, you don't lose that and have to re-request it. Uh, so come, you know, the first week of October, you should see data. Um, as far as how long it takes, um, we are gearing up to, to work on that this week, and we hadn't pushed real hard. So if you requested, say, you know, a week or 10 days ago, it doesn't take us very long. But again, we were, um, you know, it wasn't a priority because there's no data there to see. So, but we will get it to you before, um, certainly before October 1st. But um, if you've requested it previously, you should um, see it within the next week. It doesn't take us long. Mark and his team have the bigger lift on getting your CFNC account situated and also, um, you know, doing that verification for all of the, the basic reports. And then we just have one little extra add on the finish the FAFSA. So, all right, well, I'll go ahead and share my screen then April, if that's all right. Um, so, So finish the FAFSA, we've talked about this already, but I'll start here where um, we know that uh, the access to finish the FAFSA is limited. It's not wide open and it might not be every education professional. It is education professionals based at the school who work directly with seniors on FAFSA completion and college access. And even more than that, the organization has to have an agreement signed with our agency. It's a confidentiality, a Davis data security agreement. So um, nearly all, 99% of the public schools in North Carolina have signed that agreement. So if you're at an LEA, you know, you're in, you're in good shape. Some of the charter schools with seniors have not. So uh, that's an alert, but we will know that if you make a request for access to finish the FAFSA and you're at a charter school that does not have a signed agreement, we will reach out to you to go to your leadership and ask them to take care of that. Uh, legal item. And as, as I said, about half of the charter schools with seniors have already signed that agreement. In addition, College Advising Corps, Gear Up, they have signed agreements. So those are examples of education professionals who are not counselors, but they're based at a school. They work with seniors on FAFSA completion 
and they've signed the agreement. So if you have another volunteer organization who comes in to help your students, they may not be able to have access. So an organization, the LEA, the College Advising Corps, um, these other uh, college access organizations also need to have a signed agreement and be, you know, there are some parameters around who that can be. So for the most part, the folks that you are working with who work with seniors should be able to have the access, but a little bit of legal stuff um, out of the way there. This is just a repeat of what Mark said. Um, there is a link inside your Pro Tools request form that sends you to a Smartsheet that we at SEAA monitor. So our legal counsel at first wanted us to collect a document from everybody to somehow document that they work with seniors. So, you know, early on we pushed back on that. We don't want anybody having to submit a document. Um, we do have to have you check a box that says, I certify that I work with seniors on FAFSA completion. So, you know, we ask you to do that so that the responsibility is, you know, on the, the, the user to then uh, commit to that. And of course, we are then on the backside checking to make sure that you're with the school or an organization that has this signed agreement. So that's another, um, another little double check there. So I did uh, have a direct link to that smart sheet for finish the FAFSA request. So if for some reason you've already got a Pro Tools account, you could go back into Pro Tools and make your request there, but you can also click that smart sheet link directly. That's what allows us to add that second level, to add the flag that says yes to finish the FAFSA. So I hope that helps. Um, it's a little more streamlined. Did those of you who've been around when we had the professional center, it was a little a different process and it felt like you were kind of doing parallel work. Well, now you're in your Pro Tools, finish the FAFSA's in there. It does require a little extra step, but it's not too bad. So again, um, I wasn't sure that, I didn't know that I would have Mark for sure giving the, uh, the tour of Pro Tools in this session today. So we did have this bit of a help in here for you. Okay. As he said, it's important to know that you have your CFNC account tied to your professional email, and then you go to the uh, Pro Tools to set up or request that access as well, including, as I said, a link to the Finish the FAFSA access. Okay, and then it's one of the college reports. So you can see the college reports include the application progress, Finish the FAFSA, an RDS report, which I'll touch on just briefly, and then transcript tracking. So um, finish the FAFSA's right there. There are help center resources for finish the FAFSA, so um, which are publicly available. So whether you're you're you have the magic finish the FAFSA access or not, you can get to the help in um, the the Pro Tools. And there's an article that kind of gives a summary of finish the FAFSA. That's always helpful that we look for that to be developed further this year on some of your questions around the data and so forth. So more coming soon, but there's a good standalone overview of Finish the FAFSA inside the Pro Tools help. All right, I told you I would just touch on briefly the RDS report. So sometimes I feel like RDS doesn't have a champion. It doesn't have an ambassador out there. Um, and I don't want you to miss out. It's, it's a nice report, a very good companion to the other college reports. So this report tells you whether or not the students have been through the process. It does not say whether or not the student is a resident. So the yes or the no simply means yes, the student has gone through a residency and has received a determination or no, they haven't gone into RDS. Um, I don't have anything more to say about that. There is an entire session about RDS tomorrow. RDS and Spanish services, so you'll want to register for that. The experts on all of the unusual one-off situations um, are going to be available to you tomorrow. So, But know that the RDS completion report is available to you. Of course, we're here today for FAFSA tools, not RDS tools. So I want to stay here for just a second so that you know the type of data that you will see. So just a reminder, there's no data there now because last year's data is gone and the class of 23 doesn't start until October. And when the FAFSA opens, they, they're within a few days, you'll have data to see. When you see it, you, you see the student's name, you'll see their completion status, their FAFSA completion status. And there are three possible 
statuses for FAFSA completion. Not submitted means the student hasn't started, they haven't done anything, not submitted. Submitted means that they have clicked submit, but there's a problem. And when the FAFSA is submitted but not completed, that FAFSA is in limbo. And we're going to talk about that because that is a, a tremendous target for everyone um, who's working with these seniors. So there's not submitted, haven't touched it, didn't start. They're submitted, which means I've submitted it, but something's hanging up and it's not complete. And then there's completed, which is what you want. You want completed so that the student's uh, FAFSA is being considered for aid. And if you'll remember, that's one of the things that the tracker shows. It does not show any student names, but it shows how many students have submitted and how many students have completed. And typically, you want that to be the same. You want everybody who has started the FAFSA to have a completed FAFSA, but typically the completed is a subset of the submitted. So we often find there's a gap. There's 100 people who, have, 100 seniors who have submitted it, but only 92 are complete. And so our job is to go look for those eight students. So that column labeled status is an important one. The second data point is whether the FAFSA has been signed by the student. And then the third is whether the FAFSA has been signed by the parent. And a missing signature is a major reason for a submitted but not completed FAFSA. So if a student has um, a current status of submitted and you're like, aha, I need to get this kid to complete. Looking at the signed by parent and signed by student columns may, may tell you right away what the problem is because a missing signature by either the student or the parent is um, a, a major reason. The fourth data point is whether or not the student has been selected for verification. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. You can be an advocate for the student. You can be a, um, a cheerleader. You can encourage and soothe. Your job really isn't to um, isn't to help with the paperwork of verification and the process of verification, but to be that trusted person who can um, encourage the student to stay um, stay in the game. I see a question in the chat about whether the student sees submitted or completed, and it reminds me to say to everyone that when a senior completes the FAFSA, they get information back. Typically, they're completing the FAFSA electronically, and they get an email back with a uh, information that says, you need to do this. You need to get it signed. It's missing this. It, you've got an error. What you're seeing in Finish the FAFSA is not anything that the student doesn't already have access to. But as we all know, students don't read their email or they touched that FAFSA a week ago and it's, it's gone. It's out of their head. So your information is meant to circle around and provide you a way to follow up with the student. But the student who completes the FAFSA does get this information. So the final data point is a, a, over there on the right is an error code. So the professional user, you, can kind of hover over that error code to see some brief instructions to share with the student. So, and again, this is information that the student would see. But when you see it, you can encourage and push in ways that uh, might get the student across the finish line. So those five data points will um, take you a long way towards Oops, helping your students. So um, just a quick reminder, and again, we're the state agency that receives FAFSA data from the federal government, the actual data, the, the secure data. Um, and so we have an obligation to follow the rules. The federal government said, well, you can create a completion initiative, you can create a report, you can provide education professionals with um, submission information, but you have to follow these rules. Well, I've talked a lot about these rules, um, and it's true legal agreements and uh, guarantees of, uh, of, of obeying privacy laws. But I do want to say too that you don't see income information. You don't see social security numbers in Finish the FAFSA. So it is secure, but you're not seeing highly sensitive information. So you, you shouldn't stress about that. Um, but again, just the fact that the student has done a FAFSA is considered secure information. So the federal government doesn't want just anyone to know whether or not a particular student, a particular family is filling out the FAFSA. So um, a reminder that any education professional with access to the Finish the FAFSA report should not share it with someone else who does not have access. 
Um, the example I have often given is that you may have well-meaning people um, on your staff. You might have a coach or a teacher. Um, you can't print out anything and ask them to follow up with these seniors. They don't have access to the Finish the FAFSA. You can't give them the information you see in Finish the FAFSA. So that's an important uh, point to make. Even though it would, might be with the best of intentions, you cannot share this data with someone who does not themselves have access to Finish the FAFSA. All right, so these are key ways that you can actually leverage this information to, to make a difference. I, you might start with your seniors who have not even started. So they haven't done anything, they don't think the FAFSA is for them, they don't think it will matter, they aren't sure. There are all those reasons that students and families are hesitant and you can know which ones perhaps have not even started. So that would be that would be step one. I mentioned already moving submitted to completed. I mean, to me, this is low hanging fruit. These are students and families who have taken that step. I mean, they've gone to the trouble, they've created an FSA ID, they've gathered information and worked through some stuff, and yet something's missing, and maybe it's something easy, and maybe they think they're home free. While in reality, their FAFSA is not being considered for aid because it's not complete. So that moving submitted to not to completed is, is a place to start. Those are students, as I said, who have um, taken the step. Um, and it's also something that in addition to the rates for your school, it's a it's a a data point that's available on the tracker. And you know, leadership may be saying to you, if they're savvy about um, how the FAFSA works, they may be saying to you, I want every submitted to be complete. You know, you're looking at the the tracker, you see that school that I that uh, Kathy spoke of, or the one I, I the example I gave, you've got a hundred submitted but only 92 complete, you want to know who those eight kids are. So you go to finish the FAFSA and you can find the eight kids by name and you can move them from submitted to completed. You can also alert them to errors. Um, you don't have to become an expert. There are financial aid administrators for that. And there are a lot of good resources on studentaid.gov. Um, there's When you hover over that error code, there's a little bit of a suggestion on what to tell the student to do. It can get tricky to make corrections to the FAFSA. Um, depends on the timing. You know, if you discover the error right away versus I fill out the FAFSA in October and I realize there's an error you know, sometime in March. You know, so how you address the error might depend on when it is. I would take a look at the suggestions and I would always default perhaps to the financial aid administrator at a nearby campus. Those are some generous people. They will help a student. The student does not have to be enrolled there or even really planning to go there. Financial aid administrators will help anyone with the FAFSA. So hopefully you have one near you you can call on. The other one is verification. Um, so let me move on to the next slide because I've got a little bit more here about verification. So submitted but not completed, we've discussed. The error, we've discussed. So verification, you do not have to become an expert in this. It would help to just know that it, it doesn't mean the student or the family have done anything wrong. Nobody suspects them of fraud. Um, it's just one of those requirements. So the federal government requires verification of some FAFSAs, often just randomly chosen. So the information that they provided, they have to back it up with documentation. And that process is handled with the financial aid office of the campus where they are um, expecting to go. It's usually in the spring, late spring, and it could be at a point where the student is about to leave you, the staff, the school, where they are comfortable, where they trust people, and they're about to move to somewhere they don't know the, the professionals, they don't know those financial aid administrators, and it would help if you could encourage them if you could make sure that they don't let something slip. They gotta stay the course because digging up paperwork is never fun. But we don't want them to be afraid. We don't want them to give up. We don't want them to, to get lost in verification. So there's not as much verification going on this year because of COVID and there were some waivers from the federal government, but your kids, the class of 2023, next spring, um, one presumes they will be again expected to do verification, some percentage of them. 
So I'm not sure too if you're familiar with the data retrieval tool. So when the student fills out the FAFSA, they have the option to auto-populate a lot of their financial data by using an IRS tool. It's called the DRT, the data retrieval tool. That's always a good idea. Um, I understand um, that it reduces the likelihood of being selected for verification because it's pulling in information um, directly. There's not a chance that someone keyed a number wrong. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but there are some tax situations where the family cannot use the DRT. So I won't go into that partly because I'm not the expert, but um, don't be shocked if a family says or a, a parent says um, that uh, they didn't have the option to use the DRT because there are certain tax scenarios where that doesn't work. But it's always something to tell families to trust because it reduces their chance for error. So. Ultimately, verification is a federal government thing. So they have their algorithm and whatever they do, and they task the campuses with carrying it out. So, and it's been a couple of years, as I said, they um, have had significant waivers to verification during the pandemic. So, um, but presumably it will go back to, um, to a process that everyone has to deal with as we come out of the pandemic. All right, you can download your Finish the FAFSA data to Excel. So that's handy dandy when you want to sort um, by certain categories, not submitted, submitted but not completed, by error type, if you're digging in that, in that granular of fashion. You can track students by status uh, in any way that is helpful to you and your work. Another thing that you can do, so we're going to talk a little bit about the data and the problems with the data, but because you can download Finish the FAFSA to Excel, you could track your own data more carefully than the tracker, the publicly available dashboard can. So you know which seniors have entered and which seniors have withdrawn throughout the year. You could manipulate your data to provide a more accurate rate with this spreadsheet if, if that's helpful to you. Generally speaking, Finish the FAFSA is not designed for that, um, but you, with this Excel functionality, you can, you can do it that way. The tracker is really designed to show rates and allow for comparisons and you know, kind of getting a feel for North Carolina or districts as a whole. But your Excel function does allow you at your school to do something um, very specific with your own data have to say, reminder about the privacy and security. If you download these files or if you print them, you've got to make sure that they are secured and you should delete them or shred them when, you, when they're completed. You should not leave a list of students um, with their FAFSA completion status um, available. Okay, so we're about to talk about the data challenges just a little bit because it's so often um, a roadblock to you know, measuring your progress. You know, when you ask people to measure progress and then the data is fuzzy, it's very frustrating. But I thought I'd pause for a minute. I think there's a good conversation going on in the chat. So I appreciate those of you who are a little more knowledgeable than I am about the DRT and some of those issues. So go for that. Um, you know, when we at SEAA are doing, when I, I should say for sure, am doing any kind of a presentation strictly about the FAFSA, I would have a financial aid administrator to to present that with me because I'm not too bad at explaining the tool, but not one to be in the weeds on the FAFSA, um, the form itself. So I'm glad there's some conversation going on there in their chat. Absolutely, um, and I'm trying to we're trying to answer some questions here. I'm going to send over some links um, to help provide you with some more information um, about um, verification and. We have um, two folks with Spanish services at College Foundation, Juana uh, Ramirez and Juana Hernandez Lira, and uh, they're, they're able to provide a lot of information about parents without SSNs and mixed status families and all that. So I'll provide some links over to hopefully um, answer some of those questions as well. And um, I will say too that during Countdown to College, you know, there are statewide virtual student sessions, and there are several related to FAFSA completion where there will be. Um, financial aid administrators, and I, I 
at least at one or two of them, and I think they're indicated on the registration, one of our Spanish services reps will be there. They're a terrific resource, as April said, for a lot of those really sticky questions. So um, that student session, that student and family session that takes place in October will be about the FAFSA, not about the tool, which is for you. Um, and that direct to families information, we will have some financial aid expertise. So it's a good opportunity to, to drive some traffic to and to attend yourself just to find out more um, about FAFSA completion in general. Okay, so there are two tools that we're talking about. We have the tracker, the publicly available one that your leadership may be looking at, that the community college president may be looking at, that our lawmakers may be looking at. And then you have finished the FAFSA, which our education professionals in the schools have access to. So they're both showing similar kinds of data, secure uh, or not secure, but why don't they always match? That's a, a good question. And the answers to that relate mainly to the sources. Where are we getting the data? How are we getting it? And the timing. So one might update daily, which is true and the other updates weekly. So there's going to be a constant tension between the, the exact count in there. There are some questions specific to each tool. Finish the FAFSA provides you with a list of seniors. Well, uh, it's not updated regularly throughout the year. Finish the FAFSA has a list of seniors and then the very next day someone withdraws or someone adds and they're not going to populate on your Finish the FAFSA report. Now, I have a couple suggestions for this, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fact that it's not a dynamic list of seniors. So sometimes the senior shows on Finish the FAFSA, the status says not submitted, and you talk to the student or the family and they're like, I did the FAFSA. So what do you do with that? Uh, and again, I have a couple of suggestions for that. So, um, Let's talk about it a little bit, um, but I want to wait just a second until I show you a little bit more about the data. I think it might make more sense. Um, so let's first look at the tracker. Kathy um, showed you some screenshots of the publicly available FAFSA tracker. So the tracker gets its information from the federal government. No names, just a count by high school. Um, those are the FAFSA filers. Then from publicly available DPI information, we have a senior class count. It comes from the month two principal report, the principal's monthly report, month two. So again, it's a point in time and the count may not be accurate two months later. In fact, I, what school doesn't have some movement in their senior class enrollment? So there's already gonna be some issues there. Um, so the, the DPI data is a count of the total number of seniors, no names, just the total number of seniors. The US Department of Education publishes the totals by, by high school. And so that again, publicly available data, those are the FAFSA filers, how many of them? One of the problems is that there's no question on the FAFSA that says, are you a senior? So the Department of Ed has um, some kind of logic, some kind of algorithm to identify students as high school seniors their age for one, um, whether or not they've already been in college. So there's right there a couple of ways that a student might not get counted as a senior and thus not be in this FAFSA filer total. Um, you know, I have know that there are sometimes students who are at, um, they're co-enrolled, and so they will answer yes to that question of I've been in college. Well, that flags them as not a senior because the system thinks that they are an older student. Another um, thing that has happened is some um, education professionals, it wasn't widespread, but there was a group who was um, having students fill out the FAFSA as a practice in one year, and then they would fill it out their senior year, and they the system identified them as filling out a FAFSA previously, not a senior. So this doesn't happen to a huge number of your students, but it's why the total number by high school reported in the aggregate might not be perfect. Finish the FAFSA when you can look at names, you can diagnose a little bit better, but it's tough when the federal government reports you as having 360 FAFSA filers and you're like, I know it's 389 or 300. The gap is probably not that large. It's probably more less than a, you know, single digits 
of differences. But I say this to you just so you can hopefully be patient because it's not something we can fix easily on the way the, the government counts that. Um, I also wanted to say that schools with fewer than five FAFSA filers aren't reported. So until there's five, you don't have any data. All right, so let's look at finish the FAFSA and maybe we can backtrack on ways to, to have a better account and have a more accurate sense of your metrics. So finish the FAFSA secure data. We get a list of seniors from DPI by high school, so a list of their actual names, all 362 of them or however many you have. And as I said before, now that's a point in time, it doesn't update um, in a dynamic way. So those are the senior class lists. The FAFSA filers, we also get by name because we're the state agency that handles the financial aid for North Carolina state grants. So whether your students are going to the community college, a private institution, the UNC system school, there are grants and scholarships available from the state of North Carolina and the FAFSA is the application. So like Kathy said, in addition to the federal aid, the Pell, you also have North Carolina aid. Well, we're the agency that administers that. So we have access to that data and we know who these North Carolinians are and we match them. It's a dating service. We match them to the DPI senior class data. So I talked to you a little bit about why a senior might be missing and not on the list at all. I mean, it's not in Finish the FAFSA. His name is not there. But the other problem that we have is that the name's there, but it doesn't match. And there could be a couple of reasons for that. Sometimes a student uses a hyphenated name at school, but not on the FAFSA. Or sometimes they have a typo in their birth date because it is matched on the first name, last name, and birth date. So there are a couple of reasons why the data might not match. If you suspect there's a problem, then you know we could look into it, but there's not really a process to um, investigate every mismatch. When you have that, what you can do is ask the student to show you what he got or she got from the federal government. So every FAFSA filer, gets a student aid report, a SAR, student aid report. And it, it, it says if there are any problems with the FAFSA, it um, explains some of the data, you can ask the student to show that to you. You know, that small group of students who you don't have accurate information for. And again, by and large, you're gonna see them in Finish the FAFSA. We're talking about problems, but really, the problems are not the majority. You know, 95% of your kids, it's gonna be fine. But there are gonna be some that aren't listed, there are gonna be a few that don't match. And so for those, it's an extra step to ask the student to show you the document. Um, and only then if they say, I have done the FAFSA, I really have. You know, if they say FAFSA, I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> then you know, um, not to ask them about a SAR. The other thing is that you can do with finish the FAFSA where you have that Excel download. If you feel like the tracker's not correct or your seniors aren't listed um, completely in Finish the FAFSA, you take that into Excel, you can add seniors. You can delete seniors that have moved away that are no longer at your school. And you can create your own rate, perhaps more accurate, if, if you want to own the data in that way. So Finish the FAFSA does give you the opportunity to really own your own data. It's not intended for that rate, but you could use it that way and it becomes your metric then. Um, a few slides on assistance. Now this is just, I didn't wanna close the presentation without offering you some resources for your students. Um, so April is on the line, she's the CFNC expert, but here are some resources just real quick. Know that they're there because they're pretty good and they're right on CFNC. So FAFSA assistance, there's some video resources, there's the federal student aid has a live chat, um, and there's access to that information straight on CFNC. You don't have to try to hunt up different, um, different websites. The local assistance is a map of North Carolina with contact information for the different institutions. So if you don't have your local financial aid administrator on speed dial, then you could use this map or you could direct your students to use the map. Um, they're color coded by sector, community college and independence and UNC. And if you find the one closest to you and click on it, it's the financial aid 
office contact information, usually an email, a phone number, some hours of events, uh, uh, not events, but uh, FAFSA assistance um, that they offer. So good information to get some help from your local financial aid office. These are fact sheets, some video resources in Spanish and in English. Um, for the most part, these are federal resources, but super easy to get to from CFNC. So you can go to studentaid.gov and find these, but if you're on CFNC and you're familiar with it, there you go. As you can see, the top three issues are probably those listed on the left, getting started with the FSA ID, figuring out a dependent versus independent student, who is my parent, so this is good help. And then there is a YouTube playlist. I just took a quick screenshot. Um, April can speak to that more if you all have questions, um, but the YouTube playlist is often helpful to find exactly what you need and, and go straight to it. Good stuff out there. This is the last slide. I was going to land here. Um, here is, uh, you know, just a quick summary of these two tools that we've talked about. The tracker, currently on my future, which is a, a wonderful nonprofit out there doing good work for North Carolina. Our state agency administers finish the FAFSA, and we're going to take on that tracker too. You saw Kathy earlier, and I'm Catherine Marker. We're both at SCAA, and you can reach us at outreach at ncscaa.edu. And I think, um, yes, the regional reps, we want you to know you have local resources. We are not a big shop. So Kathy and I are working from SCAA on outreach, um, but those CFNC reps are near you and much more uh, accessible. That is, um, I've reached the end, but I, I hope there are questions or maybe we can, I wasn't paying attention to the chat, so um, you all can uh, jump in with other items or we can answer questions, whatever you think. Okay. Yeah, let's um, just talk a little bit about the chat for just a couple minutes, if that's okay, because we <clears throat> have had a busy chat going on. <laughs> um, between Kathy and I, we've been putting out so many different links and resources. Um, and, you know, it takes a few minutes to go get the right link to put in the chat. And so sometimes we're both in here um, giving you guys some of the same links. Um, so a couple things backing up in the chat. I'll jump in and then I'll um, see if Kathy wants to uh, also since we've both been in the chat. Um, there's a, I put a link in and it helps if maybe I put the time. <laughs> there's so many things. So at 1149, uh, put a link to um, information on what makes students eligible for the IRS data retrieval tool, the DRT. Uh so that's some information to, to help hopefully um, uh, you all know what, what makes a student eligible. Most students are eligible to use the data retrieval tool. There are some things that make students, um, that make them not eligible. For example, the way the parents file, um, married filing separately um, could cause some problems in there. Uh, but there's a few things that can make a student ineligible, but most students are eligible to use that DRT. If a student opts not to use it because it's not required, they will likely be pulled for verification. So that's a pretty much a shoe in there. So that's one way. Uh, we talked a little bit about verification. Verification, as Catherine mentioned, can be tricky for some of our students. And I do think it's important to mention, you know, the, um, um, you know, certain students with their backgrounds, um, you know, so I, I work a lot with American Indian students, just for an example, and there's a lot of history there with um, the federal government and our education system and, you know, a little bit of distrust and nervousness, and it's not just that group, not just that ethnicity, um, but there are, you know, definitely other groups that have a lot of other, you know, feelings about it also. So it can be a little confusing and it can be shocking for a student. So I do think what Catherine mentioned, um, just being able to tell the students that they're not in trouble, they didn't do anything wrong. They were either pulled randomly. I was pulled in grad school both years. So you're either pulled randomly or, you know, you, you need to be pulled because maybe your student messed up that FAFSA form so bad <laughs> that um, someone has to go through and look at it with them. So that's something that happens, right? Um, or, you know, they're pulled because they didn't use the data retrieval tool or for different reasons. So um, it's good just to, to be able to tell them, you know, it's okay. It's, very, it's common to get pulled. You know, about a third of our students are going to get pulled for verification in a normal year. Um, and, and let's just 
if you have any questions, that's what your financial aid office is, is there for. You can also contact the financial aid office at the school you're looking to attend. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, so that's just, we have some links over there for you. Um, we also talked a little bit about Juana and Juana's for Spanish services. Um, we will have one of them on tomorrow. Juana will be on tomorrow for our program about residency. Uh, so we won't necessarily be talking about financial aid, but we will be talking about residency. And so we'll have Juana on tomorrow to talk a little bit about that as it relates to the students and the, and the population that she serves. So we have some links over there. Remember that the CFNC website is completely translatable into Spanish. We also have a lot of excellent Spanish resources that are either organic that Juana and Juanas have created, or they are linked um, to websites like, um, like Fed Student Aid and um, and those types of things. So we have some resources there. We have Wana and Wana's contact information in there, some more information about um, federal verification, um, as well as links to understand um, students if, if they are undocumented or if they have parents that are undocumented or don't have an SSN, um, what to do with that uh, with, the, with the FAFSA form, as well as some links to um, the, the CFNC regional rep. So um, if this helps at all, if I know we've had a mixed conversation, right? So we're talking about FAFSA as it serves the students and then the FAFSA tools as it serves the education professionals. So if we're thinking about the FAFSA tools um, that serve you all, this is where you have your experts at SEAA with Catherine and Kathy, right? So it's like a two pony show. Um, so <clears throat> there's only two of them to, to answer all of these and to help with that. Um, so if you have questions about the FAFSA tracker, you know, especially as it transitions over to CFNC and you are working on Finish the FAFSA um, as a resource and all of those, this is where you will um, consider reaching out to that outreach at ncsea.edu. That email address goes to Catherine and Catherine. Uh, and so they're there to support you all as you are um, trying to assist those students um, through that process. If you are considering a financial aid night where we talk about the FAFSA form, talk about what financial aid is, how to apply for scholarships, all of those things, um, that's what we tend to call a financial aid night. Um, or a financial aid session, that's typically where um, you will have your regional reps available. They can present, uh, and also your local community colleges or local four-year college. We co-present with them all the time. We also do them on our own. It doesn't matter. Either way, it's fine, just as long as we're getting that information out there on what is the FAFSA, getting some basics, hopefully encouraging them to do their FAFSA. Another great way I've encouraged educators to use that Finish the FAFSA tool is if you are interested in having a program that is geared towards a certain group of students. So, for example, a certain group that, according to that Finish the FAFSA data, doesn't look like those seniors have even started that FAFSA form. Uh, and so perhaps you are offering a program at lunch or something that's just for those students. Or perhaps you have students who um, haven't completed it and you're looking to um, just have a program for just those students. Um, and that's where some of that data can be really helpful in informing your programming um, if you're thinking of having a regional rep or a financial aid administrator come out to assist with that. So lots of great ways to use that. Of course, all of our end goal is to get our students to complete that FAFSA form, because as we all know, um, they are more likely to matriculate to post-secondary education, whatever that might look like for them. So um, we all have the same goal here and providing lots of tools. So um, hopefully that helps you all. Um, I'll just pause for a second and see if Catherine or Kathy had anything else they wanted to mention before I tie up our loose ends. I, I was just going to give an example of how a school uses their own data, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Okay, so, you know, as we said earlier, we're big fans of using data to get better data. And while there's this, the FAFSA tracker is a publicly available tool to get your community interested in supporting your work in helping students complete the FAFSA, you're closest to the data than, than anybody else. And as you know, comparing your school to other schools, you know, doesn't always work so well because every school has its own context. So, so we're big fans of use the data to track your own, set a goal for your school um, and track your progress, share that progress with your leadership team at your school, um, have it be reflective of, of your local community context. And um, as April said, you can bring in those partners, whether it's your CFNC rep and or your financial aid uh, 
administrator from your local community college who can help with those specific outreach for students. So don't be afraid to set your own goal, track your own progress because you are closer to the data. As Catherine mentioned earlier, the total student class is not dynamic. So once it's kind of set for the year it's set, it's not gonna keep <clears throat> updating because that would mean your completion rates would kind of go all over the place. And so it, it, it's once it's set, we kind of keep it. But if your numbers are, are changing more than typical, then you might wanna keep track of your own FAFSA completion and keep your team informed, your community stakeholders informed so they, um, they have a sense of the progress you and they are making together to help students. The other point I, I was gonna share on verification, uh, colleges are under their own sets of regulations in terms of um, financial soundness. And so they may require some verification items that even the feds don't require in order to ensure that the whole point of the verification process is that financial aid goes to the students who need the aid. And so it, just like with tax returns, there's an, an auditing process, some percent is audited. It's a similar kind of process with verification. As April said, if you aren't using the IRS data retrieval tool, you're more apt to be selected because it isn't being verified. So, but do know that even the institutions themselves may choose to verify certain things in order to be in accordance with their own financial soundness that they are measured on as an institution. So, you know, the student, again, hasn't done anything wrong. Please reassure them. It's just part of the process in order for them to qualify for the aid that will help them go to college. So with that, I'll turn it back to, or, or Catherine, if you want to add anything, otherwise I'll turn it back I, to April. I'm, I'm gl glad that uh, you added those things at the end. It's helpful. So, no, I don't have anything more, April. Okay. Yeah, that is really helpful. And I think the context for everything is always nice. And just remembering, like Kathy said, that it is your data. And, um, you know, it, it, it's possible, like she said, for you all to set your own goals within your high schools and, you know, use that data to the best that you can. It's, it's your information. It's your high school. You know your students. Um, and we're here to help in any way we can. Um, so just a couple things as we um, tie up today, and this will answer a question I see in the chat also. Um, this training uh, has been recorded today, and it will be available in about a week uh, on YouTube. CFNC has a YouTube channel, and we will have a playlist up at some point this week um, with all of the recordings from this week's program. So while um, you aren't able to earn CEUs, if you watch it kind of retroactively, it is there as a wonderful resource for you all. Um, we have great topics this week. I'm going to throw over in the chat in just a minute my email address if you need anything, um, as well as um, the uh, link to, you know, register for other programs this week if you're interested. As Catherine mentioned before, tomorrow we have a session on RBS and Spanish services. Um, Thursday, we have a session on countdown to college best practices and activity examples. And then on Friday, we will have a college admissions panel talking about what admissions look like now um, since we are a couple years into COVID. Uh, so we have uh, good programming happening for you this week. Um, in addition, you all will receive an email later today from me with a few links of some things that seem to be you know, important topics um, this morning, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint. So you will have that. And then within the next 48 hours or so, you will get another email from me with your CEU certificate. So lots of emails coming from me um, <laughs> from me this week and, uh, and soon. Um, so in the chat, I'm going to put my email address as well as um, a couple other links, cfnc.org slash events. Um, and I'm going to add an S to that. Um, is where you can find more information on registering for these programs this week, as well as many other programs that we have. And then cfnc.org C2C is where you can find absolutely lots of information on Countdown to College as a whole. I would like to thank Catherine Marker and Kathy Hastings for Donald for being here this morning with everyone um, to uh, provide all this wonderful information. Uh, and um, yeah, we appreciate it.